Welcome to Protecting Your Assets, the show about protecting people, property, and most importantly, protecting your ass. I'm your host, Lucky Luciano, and I'd like you to join me for a fast-paced and often fiery discussion about security issues with my co-host, Brian the Angry Man Claimant. Whether we're piercing the veil of security, talking your duty of care, or raving about the latest technology, we'll share our thoughts on the issues, the trends that are impacting security today and into the future. And now, let's talk about protecting your assets. Hello, folks, and welcome to Protecting Your Assets. I'm Lucky Luciano, and with me, Brian, the angry man, Clayman. And we are on to season three, episode seven. And actually, we're going to put a bit of a slant on this episode. It's called In the Weeds. And basically, we're going to, um, you know, in, in, the, in, in addition to the guests that we're having, and we do have another guest coming on the next episode, which Brian can speak to at the end of this recording. Um, but uh, we're going to also throw in um, some sessions on what we were going to be calling In the Weeds, where we're going to share some okay. real life case studies or examples and show you how they're transitioning or, or impacting the real world of business. Um, and so today we're gonna to be talking about duty of care um, and we're gonna share with you some real world examples of where companies response really dictated, um, you know, how things ended up in, in the end. Some of them good, some of them not so good, some of them ended up in jail. So sort of give you an idea of how serious or the potential for seriousness, seriousness in duty of care cases that, that's starting to occur. Uh, in the Canadian legal environment. Before that, as usual, we're going to turn it over to Brian for uh, some comments. Uh, and, uh, you know, what have you been up to the last couple of weeks? Well, let me just start off with I'm still angry and uh, <laughs> watching you uh, sort of uh, screw up this intro. We're like on six <laughs> takes to get here. Uh, have you been drinking? Not and yet, but I'm going to. <laughs> Anyways, I'm looking forward to our discussion today on the topic of duty or care or criminal negligence. Uh, I guess the big news story is on the security policing front is another in the States, another uh, innocent individual uh, died at the hands of the police. Yeah. And, you know, I was talking this week with a uh, colleague in the uh, diversity equity space, uh, inclusivity space, and we were talking about this incident. And I was mentioning, you know, right away, everyone is quick to rush to the fact that it was a racist incident. Yeah. And, you know, I understand that even black officers could be racist because some would make the claim, I don't buy it, if the organization is institutionally racist and the people that work in it, black, white or green, are going to be racist. But I brought up to this guy who uh, I really respect and he knows this stuff. Isn't it possible rather than racism that it's just bad policing, just yeah. bad people? And I think the, the, the ugly this week in our Good, Bad, Ugly segment is that... Uh, I think what we saw there was just a bunch of thugs that give police and security a bad name. There, that outcome should never have occurred, should never have resulted to what it did. Just also on that vein, I just read there's a two Toronto cops or one Toronto cop off duty were just con uh, charged with manslaughter and the death of a uh, young lad in Brampton. Apparently he sold them a... Uh, a, a stolen or a defective uh, Apple Watch through Kijiji. When the off-duty officer realized that, they chased the guy, they uh, cut up with the guy, and uh, in the interaction, of course, the interaction, the uh, subject uh, uh, regrettably died. What was interesting in that case also is that even though it appears that the subject or the victim in this may have been involved in a criminal act, he didn't deserve to die. I don't know what's happened with the escalation. I don't know what's happened with the rules of proportionality. You know, uh, the, the crime didn't uh, necessitate the outcome. And I think it's important for police, certainly in the States, but on both sides of the border, just take a deep breath and, and really work on their de-escalation skills so that these type of bad outcomes don't occur too often. Yeah, I'm going to, you know, in the immortal words of Chris Rock in one of his routines, he said, <laughs> whatever happened to just being plain crazy? You know, yeah. we are so friggin uh, politically correct and looking to to explain everything away. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a phobia or a fear or or a condition for everything that seems to be uh, contaminating people nowadays that whatever happened, just being goddamn crazy. And yeah. to your point, maybe you're just a bad cop. Simple yeah. as that. 
It has nothing to do with the fact that you may be racist or you may have a preference for a gender or you may have a, a color that you prefer. Like at the end of the day, maybe you're just a freaking piece of crap that should never have been given a badge or a gun. And then, you know, take care of them. Get them off the force. That's the end of it. We're always looking for excuses for these things. And, and the other, you know, as you talk about it, now, my, my, my comments in terms of what I've been seeing the last couple of weeks was all this craziness on the, on the TTC and public transit. And I know we're going we're gonna to have an expert on that coming in on the next episode, but, you know, how you get on the news and, and they throw 80 cops at the problem and, you know, it's because these people are in need and all this distress. And, yeah, I get you want to try and help people, but at the end of the day, some of them are just plain damn crazy. And let's start dealing with it at that level. Stop making excuses for people's behavior. Well, I, I agree. I mean, that's a really good point. And I, you know, it's not too often that you have good points, certainly that I agree with. But I think you're right. Chris Rock is right. Whatever happened to Dan Crazy, there are too many people with agendas out there that are going to look at an incident and uh, make it fit into the box that they're trying, their soapbox, okay? Huh. And, and I, I think really, yeah, sure, there's racism out, racism out there. Sure, there's people yeah. that shouldn't be in the jobs there. There's no doubt about that. But to say that every single thing that happens that goes bad in interaction with police or security is because of racism, I mean, that's simplistic. And that in itself is a racist comment because yeah. that's not going to get to what the issue is. In my opinion, from what I read, what happened in the States, those cops were just, should never have been cops. There was a lack of super, uh, supervision and oversight. There was a lack of training. And there was uh, seemingly these... Uh, officers were in a squad where they had a lot of high risk interactions and there was no one watching i yeah. mean in the racism piece i don't know but interestingly every one of them was a, a black officer yeah. i don't know what that means but you know i just don't think it's simplistic to say anything that goes wrong especially it involves police or security is a racist event it's simplistic it's disingenuous and i think that act itself is more racist than many of the acts say attribute to racism. Well, uh, it belittles, it belittles or downgrades when the actual, uh, you know, the uh, an actual racist event or uh, a mental illness event takes place yeah. because everybody's crazy. Well, then you know, if everyone's mentally ill, then it all sort of starts to even off. So a guy who cuts up cats is on the same plane as a guy who is really, you know, very depressed and struggling with life's issues. They're both mentally ill, so people will start putting them on the same plateau, and that's not fair to the ones who legitimately suffer from those types of issues. So I agree with you. Like calling it racism, it, it just downplays when the actual racist racism occurs. events happen, and it's not fair to, to those victims and those people. And one more thing on the angry side that you talked about TTC, what really um, angers me is <laughs> that when you look at what they're doing in Toronto and the Toronto police put 80 officers on there, there's still that group of people that say, we don't need police, we need yeah. social workers. Listen, my opinion is we need them all. <laughs> we need them all. We need a holistic, all-hands approach to the problem. But I'll give you an example. When you go to the hospital with a heart attack, okay, and you're in cardiac arrest, and they wheel you in, they don't come with a nutritionist and a social worker and uh, someone looking at uh, the stress that you're under. They try and pump your heart to get you alive to save your life. It's akin to what's happening in the TTC right now. There's people running around, nasty people running around with weapons, whatever, and hurting yeah. some people. And I don't care if they're mentally disturbed or socially uh, 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 have some sort of societal issue. It's like the heart attack. We need the police to get this thing under control. And we also need the social workers. But you got to get the peace before you can keep the peace. I, I just hate the people that are on their soapboxes. A lot of them are politicians, municipal yeah. politicians, activists. If it was their loved one that was getting stabbed, I wonder if they'd want a social worker or a police officer. Yeah. Oh, I, in the old days, I, I go back to another comedian, Bill Burr. He says, you know, you see somebody on a on a bus acting the, so, like Sammy Yatim, you know, whacking off in the back. He's got a knife in his hand and acting all kinds of crazy. In the old days, white van would have pulled up with two guys. They would put a straitjacket <laughs> on him, tied him up, and away he goes. But today, in today's world, you let them out. They need time. They need space. We got to help them. I, I I get the empathy, and I'm all for the empathy. But we've gone so far over to the other side that. We got to start reining this back, man. Like people need to be able to go into the roads, go to work, 
uh, go on public transit and feel safe. They never mind themselves for their kids. I, I, I would not let my kids go on to, the, to any bus nowadays. I, I will drive them. I will take the extra freaking 20 minutes, an hour, whatever it is. I'm going to drive them to where they need to go. I would never put them on transit the way it is right now. Okay, that you needs know, to be taken control of. On the ugly side, I was going to stop with the two, but you've got two comedians right now. I defy you to have a third one. <laughs> Give me the, a sec. The thing that pisses me off is bail reform and the lack of bail reform. And if we just look at the tragic uh, two incidents uh, involving uh, Indigenous folks, one that happened recently with the OPP officer that was killed by that uh, uh, man and woman out in yeah. uh, Caledon, I think. And that guy was on, he breached conditions a million times. I don't know why he was on the street. And earlier in the year, that tragic uh, killing again on a uh, native uh, indigenous reserve in Western Canada, Central Canada, and the two brothers were involved, uh, had lengthy criminal records, yet they were out in bail. So let me find, let me see you bring a comedian into this. I got it already. It's in my head. As soon as you started talking about it, Will Ferrell, not really stand up, but a scene, and you know it, in Elf. When he's running around the turnstile going, we it just keeps going round and round, round and round, just like our system. They just I go quit. in and they come right back out. Okay, I got nothing else for you on this segment. Now. <laughs> you win. All right, let's move on to duty of care. And uh, I want to talk about some of the examples we got because I think they're really important. They, they do show, uh, you know, a change in or in uh, compliance expectations, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, what what companies were allowed to do years ago is certainly not going to be allowed today. Um, and despite that, we still have blatant, uh, you know, violations of health and safety standards, expectations, compliance, all that type of stuff. So before we get into that, I know you're big on duty of care. Give us your rendition of what duty of care is and why it's important. You know, a lot of people think, and I see this in my practice, especially when we're doing RFPs or we're working with clients that want to understand their relationship with the security company. Uh, uh, especially in property management. Property managers have a duty of care to make sure they're running a safe and secure operation where assets are not at risk, where people can come in and use the space in a safe sort of manner. People seem to think the duty of care responsibility is someone else's. I'll give you two examples. I know many property uh, management people that think it ain't my responsibility, it's the contract security provider. Uh, I know a lot of homeowners that will hire a guy to clean their windows or to paint and put up a, a ladder, they have a duty of care responsibility over that person because if they're not uh, operating in a safe manner, they have responsible, they're responsible, they could be liable. So I just think there's a lot of misunderstanding about duty of care. I think it's a term that people use without really understanding uh, what it means. And I think when it goes bad, and you're gonna talk, I think shortly about when it goes bad, when it goes bad, ultimately, and people get sued, Ultimately, it's because there's a failure on a part of someone that had a duty of care to exercise that duty of care. Yeah, we're going to get into some cases where um, essentially it comes down to negligence and the difference between negligence and criminal negligence is sort of the, the, the line where uh, negligence, your insurance will pay it off. The company will continue to uh, function, you would hope, if it's prepared properly. But criminal negligence is, is, the, surprise, is the one I think we're going to talk about more so today because we are seeing an increase in those types of charges, which is an indication that people don't get it. They don't want to get it or they just don't. Uh, well, in one case, you'll see that they did get it. They just ignored it. Um, well, but that's, that's I think, the fundamental underlying theme when we talk about duty of care. It's really about are they doing, are you doing your due diligence? Are you doing what's expected? Or are you being negligent and to what level? Is it safe to say, and again, I'm not really sure because I'm not a lawyer, although I did play one in a high school play many years ago. But is duty of care is when you uh, fail to do uh, what you have an obligation to do by creating a safe environment, making sure people are safe. Duty of care is what we call it in tort law or civil law. And when that occurs and rises to the level of cr uh, criminality, that's criminal negligence, right? They're the same things? Yeah, and I actually have a definition here from our beloved justice system website. <laughs> what does wanton or reckless disregard for the lives and safety of others actually mean? So the definition from the website is the requirement that an accused behavior, including omissions, showed wanton or reckless disregard for the lives or safety of others has been interpreted by the Supreme Court of Canada to mean a marked and substantial departure from what a reasonable and prudent person would have done in the same circumstances. 
and reasonable is all over the criminal code, as you know. It allows lawyers to make a ton of money arguing over what that definition is, and it causes a lot of confusion on our side in terms of what would be deemed reasonable. So I have a question for you because I'm a little bit confused. I, I thought I understood your uh, definition until you brought Chinese food into this. Wonton like in wonton soup, or did you mean wanton? Like Wanton. Uh, wonton. I'm an ESL. Give me a break. Now you're being racist. No, I'm not being racist. It's just that I haven't had lunch, and you know, I, I I heard wonton. I thought about wonton soup, but I didn't realize it had anything to do with duty of care and negligence. And just to be clear, then we're talking about criminal acts. We're not talking about duty of care, which means you can get sued, and if uh, uh, for, uh, there could be monetary damages. This is people go to jail with these. Yeah, well, uh, it's the next step. Next, it's, yeah, it's intentional, um, and what can be deemed as intentional, right? Because you may think it's not. So yeah, I wanted to, to bring up a couple of, of um, uh, examples of where the, 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 the client or the defendant, let's use it that way, yeah. um, was, was th their actions not, weren't necessarily intentional in the sense that they wanted somebody to die. I don't think any of these people wanted somebody to die. But what they had they a doing, duty of care obligation. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Uh, but they're, you know, I think in, in some cases, they were just being pressured by... Um, the, the job and the demands to perform and time. And mm -hmm. so they cut corners. So, you know, it's tough. I find it tough to say that somebody's going to cut a corner knowing that they're going to hurt somebody or kill somebody in their mind. Maybe they're thinking it's okay. It's going to happen, obviously, but it's, it's a fine line. Like, you know, well, it, it is. And, and that's the thing with duty of care, criminal negligence. It means that someone actions or lack of actions were so egregious that someone was hurt and you know to the point of maybe dying and, and you're right you know uh what i've noticed with clients especially uh, uh in the real estate vertical property management their their hearts in the right area they're trying to keep their operating costs down they're trying to deal you know make the tenants happy and everything so if there's a security breach because there's not the right level of security it's not because anyone wanted that wanted it to happen but they were looking or focused on something else. And that's why it's such an important concept that our listeners have to understand, okay? There's a lot of pressures. There's contract pressures. There's client pressures. Uh, I'm sure with some of the accidents, you're going to talk about the examples of construction accidents. Uh, they happen not because they wanted anyone to get hurt or die. There's pressure probably for overtime or yeah. cost containment. And, and, and But that can't supersede your responsibility to ensure the safety and security of people and property. Yeah, so and I'm going to give you four quick examples. Um, get your feedback on them. They're different sort of aspects of the same topic. And for those who are listening, just so they know, I haven't shared these, these incidents with uh, Brian, so he's either going to get very angry because he's not prepared properly or, or he's going to go blank, which is usually what I have to deal with. But let's hope for the best. <laughs> All right. First case is, it'll ring a bell right away. And I think this one's important because I think here, if any of them were, were intentional, I think this one really leads towards being intentional. And it's the case of Metron Construction. Um, and you may remember it was a swing stage that collapsed downtown the, the, Toronto. At the concert stage? No, this is the swing stage from the apartment buildings. Okay. okay. Going back a few years, I'll give you the quick uh, synopsis. Um, the plea was based on the site supervisor's failure to take reasonable steps to prevent bodily harm and death. So basically, these guys were working on the weekend. Um, Christmas time was just before Christmas time. Um, he directed and permitted six workers, including himself. So that's where I get a hard time saying, you're not going to step on something yeah. knowing that it's going to collapse. If you know it's going to collapse, why would you Why would you step on that yeah. yourself? So, But the end result was that he, he allowed six workers, including himself, to work on a swing stage when he knew or should have known that it was unsafe to do so uh, because of, there were no serial numbers, there were no weight lift, uh, weight load bearings, uh, indicators of how many people could be on there. All that was missing, which mm -hmm. are all requirements from, uh, from the safety code that needs to be on that equipment. So despite that, he allowed six people to get on that stage, directing and permitting those six workers, including himself, to board the swing stage, knowing that only two lifelines were available. Industry standards and health and safety obviously require all employees to have uh, their own lifeline and permitting and permitting persons under the influence of drugs, which I'm suspecting is marijuana, to, to continue to work. Um, now, the interesting thing here is why I think it becomes intentional is because this was done on the weekend. So I'm, I'm I used to work construction, so 
when they did all the borderline shit, which still uh -huh. happens today, typically they would do that at night or on the weekends when they knew inspectors weren't going to be around. Uh, it was loosey goosey and you can get away with this type of stuff. And nine times out of 10, you would. In this case, it collapsed. And I think you may recall that a couple of directors ended up getting charged criminally yeah. and going to jail. Um, so your thoughts on this? Well, I think it's a great example. It's again, you know, there was no intention to have the outcome that we had and people getting hurt, but people wanted to get the work done and they're prepared to cut corners. And uh, I, I remember that now that you brought that uh, case up and I'm not sure the outcome, I don't know if they were charged criminally or just civilly were sued, but uh, it's when you peel back the onion on these types of incidents, they were always so easily avoidable. It's just that someone decided to cut a corner. That's all I got to say. That's all you got to say? That's all I got to say. Project manager Vadim Kazanelson was sentenced to three and a half years in jail for his role in a swing stage accident. Five workers fell 13 stories after the swing stage broke apart at an apartment renovation project in Toronto. Four of them died. At the time, Kazan Nelson was aware that the appropriate fall protection gear and standards weren't being met, but did nothing and allowed the workers to continue. Metron construction owner Joel Swartz and his company were fined $750,000 in 2013 for their negligence connected to the tragedy. The swing stage supplier Swing and Scaff of Ottawa was also fined $350,000 for failing to ensure the platform was in good condition. All right. Well, let's continue on to the more recent one, which involves Condrain, a big um, roadworks company in, in Ontario. Uh, and this one you're familiar with, but there's not a lot of details that we can really speak to on this because it's still before the course. Actually, their first hearing is on February 13th. So it's still, it's going to be Monday or Tuesday. And this but is a the, criminal hearing, right? Not civil. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, and, and it, the, the unique aspect of this one is that uh, for those who don't know, um, Condrain was working their road improvement company. There was a large hole uh, in the middle of the road, uh, apparently, allegedly. It wasn't properly uh, cord quartered off. Well, it, Luke, maybe just explain. It wasn't a hole. It was like a crater that could swallow an elephant. <laughs> yes. I'm, it swallowed the car, so that's yeah. how big it is. Yeah. Uh, so you're right. It wasn't a hole. It was big enough to swallow a car uh, with six people in it. Um, who ended up plunging to their death. So that gives you the, the sense of how big that hole was and the area wasn't properly cordoned off or, or enough barriers were, were put up. Uh, at least that's the allegations at this point. But the unique thing here, Brian, is that the criminal negligence charges is actually against the company and not any particular individual. So I don't know how that's going to translate to prison time potentially for anybody if that's what happens. I believe in those cases, and again, anyone that's a lawyer out there, you might correct me with a comment uh, on our um, YouTube page. But I think in those cases, the the CEO and the president and the senior leadership team, someone it wears it. I mean, the company has the company is its own entity. But when it to, with civil law, but when it comes to criminal law, you're right. Someone has to go to jail. Someone has to pay the uh, uh, you know the consequences of the action. I, uh, in cases that have happened in the past, it usually is a senior executive, either CEO or president, very high level. That's it? Well, no, okay. I'm allowed to talk still? No, I'm it. just, usually you go on and then all of a sudden you just stop. It's, this is like a new, I'm not prepared <laughs> well, for this. Well, that case I'm, I'm aware of because it happened recently, uh, or it's just materializing through the courts right now, proceeding through the courts. But that's another example whereby those kids, those victims were innocent victims who were driving down a road. That road should have been blocked. It should have been properly lit. There should have been warning signs. I don't know the facts in this case, but that doesn't seem to have happened. And someone who had a duty of care who ought to have known, okay, either was incompetent or just indifferent. And the result were, I think, four young people died. And that hole was so big that those young people were reported missing and they were only found many many hours later yeah. and the car like this road was a main road not like a highway but it was a main road it wasn't like a tertiary uh, country road and the car was there that's how deep it was that they weren't seen this was a horrific accident yeah. and it was a one of the worst examples of indifference uh that i could think of yeah, and, yeah and one more thing uh, now that you got me going there is a criminal case, but there will always be the civil case as well. And I think the civil case will wait till the criminal case is over. 
I suspect there's a good opportunity that the company will be found guilty and some senior leader in the company may face jail or some sort of a fine. But once that's over, I think the company is going to have this shit kicked out of them. And the thing I always say about duty of care to my clients is when they say we have insurance, we're not really worried the insurance will pay. Well, think again. I mean, if it was wanton, I mean, wanton, blatant disregard, the insurance company may not pay. And then the second thing is, even if they pay, your brand and reputation is tarnished. I mean, yeah. if I was to call that company, if I was a municipal government and call them to do a road construction project with their track record and history, I don't, I have a duty of care to make sure the contractors I bring on board are competent. I mean, the, the I, I've often said uh, to people that I've dealt with that even if the insurance pays, okay, and even if you're fine, I'm sorry, even if the insurance doesn't pay, and even if it's a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollar fine or a million dollar fine, it's not going to bankrupt Air Canada. It's not going to bankrupt Cadillac Fairview. It's not going to bankrupt large companies. But what will kill you is the brand and reputation damage that could occur. Yeah, and I, you know, the the those insurance contracts, those companies, the small print is getting larger and larger in content. Right, I agree. <laughs> they're putting more and more conditions in there to protect themselves against stuff like this where, where you should have known better and they're not going to pay out just because you screwed up. They, you, you have to show stuff. Actually, you quickly go back to G20. If you remember some of the discussions we had with the insurance oh, industry. With the we windows. Ramp- yeah. What's that? With windows. Big yeah, thing. well, we were ramping up our yeah. preparations for yeah. um, for G20 and we went to the insur- our insurance, insurance company at the time and asked them, you know, where's the line? Like, how are you going to pay out um, if something happens, how much do we need to insure? And their response was basically, you know, they had a kitty where all the insurance companies con- uh, you know, contributed so much. Um, and that kitty was for G20. And, and the people who would get access to that funds would be the landowners, the property owners who did the most to protect their business. Yeah. And, that, and then the ones who did the least would be at the bottom of the trough. So there may, they may get nothing for their inaction. And that's just evolving in the sense that if you look at cyber and cyber claims, all insurance companies, they may give you cyber protection, but if you get breached and you didn't have the basics, you didn't have, let's say, dual factor authentication, you didn't have Norton antivirus, you didn't have whatever was reasonable that other people in your uh, domain, in your industry would do, you're not covered. And they make that very, very clear. So a lot of people have to give their head a shake when they say we've got insurance. You've got insurance, but most insurance, to your to your point, has a, a, a duty of care clause. And if you don't do your if you don't fulfill your duty of care, they're not going to bail you out. And, and that flows nicely into my third example before the fourth. The fourth one I'm going to leave to the end because it's actually a good example, I think, of when you do things right. But the third example is I, I'm going to lump three of them together because. They really are the same type of um, negligence. Um, one of them, Lec, Lec, Lec Magantic. I don't even know how to Lac say it. Lac Magantic. Yeah, you're French. You can figure that out. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not French. I'm from Quebec. Lac Magantic. Yeah, so, sure. But we all remember the big train uh, disaster out uh, out in Quebec a few years ago that unfortunately wiped out of town, literally wiped out of yeah. town. Um, and the owners of that company were charged criminally as well. And when you look at the background to that case, um, why was that? Well, because first of all, there's um, the allegation, went, well, the allegation, the reality was they had one worker on that train where they're supposed to have two. Um, and that one worker wasn't able to test the brakes when he parked the train at the end of the night at the top of a hill. I don't know why he picked that spot, but parked the train, allegedly put, a, put on half of the brakes that he's supposed to have been put on. And then once he turned off the locomotives, the pressure to those brakes went offside. The the you know the air leaks out, releases the brakes down the hill. It went, and the rest is history. Unfortunately, and you know destroyed the town. Um, and probably I think it's the, that company is no longer operating. Yeah, anymore. it was a rail company out of the states, and they're out of business. Yeah. So so there's there's one where the processes were cut, and they were cutting corners, and it ended up. I mean, you can show that there's intent there because you, you're cutting the resources that you're supposed to be abiding by. A lot of those issues, like the one one conductor, supposed to be two, there's a compliance requirement that they were ignoring. And quickly, just to give you an idea of two other similar ones, and they've also resulted in the same type of, of, of response, just not as high profile. But there's another example in my research where um, a construction worker driving a truck uh, full of sand, a dump truck, parks the truck on top of a hill again, 
gets out of the truck, goes down, walks down to the bottom of the hill to do something. You know, Cole's notes, the truck's brakes release and the truck comes down, runs the person over, dies, subsequent lawsuit and criminal charges. In that case, similar to um, the, the train derailment, the it was found that the owners of the dump truck hadn't serviced the brakes in like four or five years, uh, no maintenance records for 12 years. So the thing was just a ticking time bomb. And so again, good on them for charging the owners because they should be charged in those cases. Let's stop cutting corners and protect your damn workers. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think it's, it comes down to that, cutting corners. People just don't want to do the things they need to do. They don't want to do their due diligence. And you can get away with it only for so long till it catches up with you. And the real sad thing with duty of care uh, uh, litigation uh, claims, the uh, claims for litigation or criminal negligence, typically someone gets hurt and someone innocent gets hurt because they relied on someone else to keep them safe or do the right thing. You know, when I walk into the path in downtown Toronto or I send my kids uh, downtown Toronto, they're going through the path, my adult kids, I'm assuming that they're when they're walking through the path, going through Commerce Court and then Brookfield Place and then uh, Road Bank Plaza, that those operators of those buildings know what they have to do to keep yeah. people safe and are doing it. If uh, if they're not doing that, they're failing in their duty of care. And if something went wrong, they would have a lot of liability, uh, responsibility. And there'd be a loss of public trust. We just assume that corporations are doing the right thing. And far too often, that's not the case. Yeah. And one more thing I'll just say about that, you get me all excited now. If I hear another big company that say says you can't put a dollar amount on a life, I'm going to throw up. They do it all the time. We do this in business all the time. And that's okay to choose where your dollars are spent, but you can't cut corners when it comes to your fiduciary, your legal duty of care obligation to ensure the people or assets entrusted to you are safe and secure. Yeah, absolutely. I don't need that token thoughts and prayers press release that they, yeah. they all do after after the fact. <laughs> so let's head on to our last example, which we're both very familiar with and uh, hits home because it is a property management example. And that's the uh, shooting at the Eaton Center back in 2012, where um, well, a punk went into the Eaton Center food court and decided to shoot somebody, ended up killing two people, I believe in mm -hmm. that. Um, and uh, in that case, the company, the person who faced the most charges was the property owner. Yeah, more uh, than the criminal. Yeah, well, yeah, I think if I remember, it's going back a few years, but when I looked at the initial judgment, and none of this is classified, it's all public knowledge for those who are listening, um, I think the police agencies and the parole board were charged like 14 or 15 counts. Um, the actual shooter, two counts. We've got nothing that you can go after. But uh, the, the, the owner, Cadillac Fairview, was, was on the hook for like 26 or 27 counts uh, in, the, in those lawsuits that, that followed. So it just lets, it should let our listeners know that you may think it has nothing to do with you, which this had nothing to do with Cadillac Fairview. It was unfortunately the wrong place, the wrong time. Um, but they were dragged into it. And so all the, diligence that they took that they made all the training that they implemented all the work that went into making sure they had a good guard service that responded and they did respond uh, the way they Excellent. were expected to respond yeah, yeah exactly good. even when you do everything right in this case you're still going to be found negligent at some level the only thing that that does for you doing everything right at least you know instead of paying 100 million you might pay out 25 million and that's a world of difference in the world of business so don't think that even when you're doing things right, you just check the box and you're free and clear. They're still going to come after you. So that's why it's even more important to make sure that you're doing everything you can and is reasonable. Do it right. Yeah, I mean, you're right, because I think CF still ended up paying some money, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. But because they did it right, because they documented, because they had prescriptive programs and contracts, they were able to demonstrate that we were not in violation of our duty of care. We were not grossly negligent. So you're always going to be negligent. You know, when there's a claim against a big company, there's always, not always, but often there'll be a degree of negligence attributed to the big company. That's just the way it is. But you don't want to be grossly negligent. Because like you said, the difference is a $100,000 fine or claim or a $100 million claim. It just comes down to quantum how much. And also your reputation. Grossly negligence means that you just willfully decided that you're going to look the other way. Negligence yeah. is really, the legal term is, shit happens. You know, yeah. and it's not necessarily a negative aspersion against you. 
So, yeah, so that's really it. We're keeping them short and sweet and to the point. I think, you know, we've shared a couple of uh, real world examples with our listeners today and, and provided some insight and thoughts on what we think is important. I hope I hope you guys appreciate that and, and find value in that. Um, but uh, before we go, you know, the next episode, we're going to be talking about public transit which is high on everyone's radar right now. And I, I think a lot of liability and duty of care issues will come out of that. Um, and Brian, did you want to do sort of a short intro on, on our speaker? Sure. We Our guest next week is a real expert in that area. First of all, people, if they're not familiar with Toronto, we've had a rash of violent crime occurring in our transit system, subway, buses, and what have you. We've got Bill Grodinski, who's recently retired. She's special constable for Metrolinx or Go Transit. Uh, been with them for about 12 years. Prior to that, he was, I think, 30 some odd years with the Ontario Provincial Police, retired as a staff superintendent. And Bill has graciously uh, agreed to come on and talk about really what this transit security look like, certainly at uh, Metro Lynx or Go Transit. And we're going to try and pick his brain about what's happening in the TTC. And not to pick on the TTC, but from a transit security perspective, yeah. what's going on and what could be done. So it should be a really good episode. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking forward to it. It's timely. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people are interested and certainly concerned about their safety because a lot of people take the TTC or public transit. And again, we're not. We're not. We're not going to be slamming the red rocket. We are yeah. talking about public safety. Um, but I don't know what the solution is. Maybe he's got some ideas, and uh, I look forward to that discussion. But he has, actually, he has some very good ideas, actually, and they're really practical and, and uh, realistic ideas. So I think it's going to be an interesting uh, episode. I think we can wrap her up. Yeah, I mean, it's not as smooth as I would have liked. You sort of screwed up a big time the introduction in the first five minutes, and uh, you sort of threw me off my mark as a result of that. So, folks, I apologize for Luciano. We will be having a, a post-production uh, staff meeting afterwards, and uh, hopefully we won't put you through this again. <laughs> I want to raise. <laughs> yeah, well, then spell the sponsor's name properly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Till then, stay safe and take care. Bye, everyone. That concludes this podcast. We hope you enjoyed listening and will join us in a couple of weeks for our latest episode. Please remember to like and follow us on our sponsor's webpage, brianclayman.com, where you can leave us your comments and suggest topics you'd like to hear about in future episodes. Until next time, thanks for listening and don't forget to protect your assets. <laughs> <laughs>